Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Note Closure Show. As always, Scott Carson, excited and honored to be here with you today. More excited to that you're listening or you're watching this. If whether you're listening us to on iTunes or you're listening listening to us across our nationwide radio network or watching this on YouTube, we are just honored to have you here, guys. We appreciate your earballs and your eyeballs on however you're listening to the Note Closure Show. We are honored today to have a guy who's been gallivanting across the country, just absolutely killing it, doing an amazing job of really working with business owners and entrepreneurs across the country. And uh, this guy, we've been playing tag back and forth. Hey, let me be on your show. Let me get you on mine. Back and forth. And it's finally nice to have him settle down, quit being such a, a TV star uh, to, <laughs> to be on the show here. But we, he's going to drop some knowledge. And I guess you hear him laughing there and see him there. But our next speaker is a writer for Forbes, a two-time best-selling author, a master trainer of NLP, and was a self-made millionaire by 25 years old. He filmed in the movie The Journey with Brian Tracy and Bob Proctor. I know Bob. Bob's a friend of mine. Hosts hey. a top charting podcast, The Driven, Driven Entrepreneur on iTunes, and syndicated across the country on many AM, FM radio stations. And you might have caught him on TV on ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox. Uh, he's a well-known speaker, and some of his client lists includes the Harvard Club, U.S. Bank, McAfee, New York Life, the YMCA, NASDAQ, and Keller Williams. So we are honored. Drum roll. Uh, round of applause for our guest, Matt Browning, man. The driven entrepreneur, buddy. What's going on, man? Wow. Thank you. Thank you to all the, uh, the thousands in attendance and the millions watching at home. <laughs> Scott, what's going on, brother? <laughs> I'm doing great, man. Now, Matt, you call uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan home, and uh, we love that area. It's a great area up there. It, you know, everybody may see the photos publicly with no beard. I was giving them a hard time. I was like, is that the the, the, the Movember? Is that you just kind of chilling there? It's looking kind of nice with the gray, bud. Thank you. I, you know, I, I appreciate it. That's what my son says. I go, what color is my uh, beard? He says gray. I'm like, well, <laughs> leave it to an eight-year-old to tell you the truth. <laughs> I'm like, it's just on the chin. What about the rest? He goes, gray. <laughs> No, it does keep me warm in Grand Rapids, man. It's uh, it's warming up right now. It's like high 30s, um, not snowing until next week again. So that's a good sign. But I love it here. Real estate here is great. Um, I get two houses for half of the price of one when I used to live in California. So that's awesome news. Well, that's the, that's the people thing. It's, and that's when we met, we both uh, just hit it off. I was like, man, we, I, it feels like we've known each other before. You can't be like, I think I know you from somewhere before. I, said, I get that feeling too. But Matt, why don't you share kind of your, your real estate background experience, because you've got some great stuff we're going to dive into. I just want my audience to know that, hey, where you're coming from, you've been through the journey and some of the hiccups and hurdles that many investors and, and entrepreneurs have had along the way. So why don't you start with that, huh? Yeah, man. It's one of my favorite things is uh, I speak a lot to real estate brokers, agents, and investors. I was, was just with an investor group in LA literally last week, like a few days ago on Saturday, so three days ago. Um, and you know, I, I love sharing there because that's like always close to my home. I'm still a real estate investor myself. I still own property, but I started at 19. At 18, I, I went to work for these two brothers in the mortgage business. They taught me everything. So I always give a shout out to Joe and Ed Sweeney. One day they're going to hear this podcast and go, hey, thanks, Matt. Uh, but they kind of plucked me out of obscurity from working at Sizzler Steakhouse, gave me a job, and I learned the ropes, man. I learned everything. And by 19, I bought my first house. By 21, I bought my second one. And the little known secret, though, is I bought both of them from Ed Sweeney. He sold me my first house, sold me my second one, and really set the whole deal up. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. So I'm not some wonder kid or anything. I just... Uh, and these are in Orange County, so they weren't like little houses for 20 grand, you know, it was like 250 and the next one was 500 and change. And, um, but I got the, my ball rolling. By 22, I started my first business as a broker and running a brokerage for mortgages and then a second one for real estate. And by 25, um, I had bought over 10 houses, a couple um, seven figure plus homes and was a self made millionaire, man. Um, it was kind of weird. It was awesome. And then I chased my dream of being a life coach and NLP trainer and um, flushed it all down the toilet, lost everything and then some, uh, and then have been building it back up. So it's an interesting story about really kind of getting almost like penalized to chase your dreams. But I think sometimes when you chase your dreams, it's not always as easy as it's supposed to be. It's not always unicorn farts and rainbows and you know all that fun stuff. Sometimes uh, there's real blood, sweat and tears involved. And for me, it took a couple of years of really hard work chasing the new dream until I could kind of build back something. 
but I've always have a place in my heart for real estate, for investment, um, you know, notes and deeds of trust, as you'd call them in California. <laughs> and I just, you know, I, I love that whole space, man. And I really love taking people who are passionate about it and helping them just get to that next space, next level, whether it's mindset or whether it's strategy, I do them both. That, that, that brings up a good point. I mean, it wasn't all just you kind of chasing the dream. There was a little bit of a recession and some major stuff that happened in there as well to a lot of people too. We can agree to that, right, man? Yeah, I would say, I mean, and it's funny, I don't actually share that part of the story with the timing because the timing was 2008, 2009. Yeah. Um, and that's, I mean, talk about the worst time ever to say, I'm going to pivot on my career and do something different. But I think it's really important that, that I want to make sure everyone knows I never once blame the economy or right. blame the downside because you can make money up and you can make money down. For me, it was because I changed gears and I felt in my head, that, in my heart that I had to abandon the investment part of my business, which was a huge business. Um, and I wanted to chase, you know, the, the new dream looking back now in hindsight and being almost 40 years old, I'm not young, I'm not old. It's a weird place to be. I'm yeah. in this middle zone where it's like, I have some wisdom or experience, maybe experience is better than wisdom, but I have some experience, but I know there's more to come. And looking back, I probably would have kept my business going. I would have continued to flip the houses I should have flipped. Um, and, you know, and then also chase my dream. It was like, you could have done both, but I didn't. <laughs> well, but I, I don't, I don't think that's a, a bad, I think a lot of people are going through it. A lot of entrepreneurs, I, a lot of people are, are struggling kind of where they want to go. You know, um, you know, some people get burnt out on doing the same old, same old. They want to chase that dream. They want to do something different. There are, what they're doing is like, well, this isn't quite as sexy as I thought it would be, or I'm not really having any fun anymore. I want to do something that I can feel maybe has a bigger impact on people or as more of a, uh, uh, well, impact is always a big thing, but always kind of more rewarding to oneself of being able to, yeah, fix and flip a house is a great and selling it and making profits, but maybe you don't have quite the impact that you have on, on society as a whole that a lot of people are really looking for. Cause I, let's face it, society's kind of a rough thing right now. There's a lot of hate and ugliness out there. And I think the world could use a lot more loving and, and people that want to give out there. Huh? A amen, man. Amen. Um, that's, that's really what most, you know, my life is about today. Like I said, now I still love investing, but, and I love when I had you on my uh, podcast of Driven Entrepreneur, that was a fun time. And you get me excited about like, well, maybe I should start getting distressed notes. That's kind of a good thing. But I'm just, you know, at this point, I'm kind of a traditional real estate investor. And after the ups and downs, I'm just doing a standard, hey, I'm going to find a good deal in a house. I'm going to make sure that it positive cash flows or at least neutral on a 15 year loan. And I'm just going to get the house and rent it out. Or the one we're living in now will become a rental in a year or two. And like, that's just what I'm doing really easy at a one or two that I can maintain as long as I want <laughs> uh, yep. every year. And like, I, I'm going easy on that. I love doing my business. I love doing NLP trainings. I speak, as you said, and do TV. And I just love um, running the leadership side of business. We're putting in a couple of leadership events next year uh, at the Air Force Academy and one at the oh. Olympic Training Center. And then we have one slotted uh, 13 months from now at uh, NASA, which is incredible. So that's the kind of stuff that like fills me up. I'm like, this is exciting. I want to yeah. do some leadership at this high level. And I love booking my speaker clients and my entrepreneur clients into those things. And um, so, you know, it's fun. It's fun. But I'm always, always gonna be part of real estate. That's why I'm here with you. Well, that's the thing. A lot of people have that in the background and, and keep rock and rolling. Now that you're in Grand Rapids, Michigan, as you said beforehand, Life got business got a whole lot more affordable than in, in Southern California. For sure. <laughs> That's the truth of it. But let's talk about some things as uh, for our listeners out there that are, you know, you know, we're in, uh, you know, November right now coming to the end of the year, people are kind of pre planning their next year on, on where they want to focus and where they want to go. Uh, I love uh, your talk you've given recently about some of the leadership traits of uh, villains in movies and some of the things out there have been really good. Oh, but you got that. The, you know, it is, it's great. I loved it, man. Um, yeah, I, I just did that segment on uh, CBS, Washington, DC. That was really, really fun. And and I did it on Fox too. I'm, I'm an equal opportunist. I don't care what the network is, <laughs> but I love getting the message out. It's just about, you know, it's about, it's about being able to step up as a leader, take on traits, but I was always trying to find a fun entertainment spin to it. Right. So like the people on the morning shows, you know, they have a good time with it. Um, when a because a lot of villain movies came out that's what made me think of it so the joker maleficent uh, even star wars you know we're focused on the dark side and you know and, and that's kind of the exciting thing so uh, i thought man actually some of these villains make really really good leaders you know like think about it like they're always stubborn they never give up they have unlimited resources 
Luke Skywalker blew up the Death Star and Darth built another one. You know, it's like how many pe- business owners would say, yeah, yeah, my whole thing got blown up. I'll just build another one. Um, but yeah, villains, uh, they might not have the best approach always, but they have phenomenal leadership skills. Let's, let's talk about that when life blows stuff up for us because it happens. Let's do Whether it. it's in, 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 we're going down a path in one way and suddenly something happens. You know, what are some of the biggest characteristics that you find, not only of villains, but also people that are successful that are on the, the good side? The, uh, the force, I guess we could say, since we're talking Star Wars here, are, are some of the most important characteristics to have or work to obtain to help you get over that hump and move on down the road to the next, uh, next bit of success? You know, so I could talk characteristics and there's certain characteristics like resilience and discipline and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, and those are all very important. But the reality is, if I said, we'll have more discipline, you're like, well, how the heck do I do that? Or be more resilient. Oh, okay, that, wonderful. I think some practical applications, some practical ideas. Number one is I would say when things happen, be conscious of the language you use. Um, the thing that, that I, I teach and I've been teaching for almost 15 years now is NLP, which is Neuro Linguistic Programming. And neuro, just fancy word for kind of the language of the mind, right? Neuro-linguistic, language of the mind. And understand that our mind has its own language. So when you say a word, it's not about being positive or negative. But when you say a word, that word actually elicits a response and creates some kind of what we call an internal representation. It creates a, a picture internally or in your mind, pictures, sounds, feelings, and all this stuff. So for instance, if I say I went to go buy a car. And I came back to you and I said, and you said, uh, Matt, how was the car? And I said, you know, Scott, I didn't get the best deal. If I use that specific language and those words, that would create a picture and a feeling in my mind and maybe in yours too. But what if I, instead of saying I didn't get the best deal, what if I said, you know, I kind of got ripped off a little bit. Mm-hmm. Like would it's, it's, I'm describing the same experience, but the language is actually changing my internal reaction to it, which is very important. What if I came back and said, they screwed me over and took advantage of me? Like, if I said that, all of a sudden you're getting a real response, right? It's like, now I'm getting my cheeks are flushing and I'm breathing heavy. So now I get the question of, okay, things happen to me. Um, A partner uh, isn't forthright or did they embezzle or what happened to the economy? You know what? The economy's down and I'm going to find a way to overcome this or the economy is crashing around me and I have no chance of survival. The words you choose don't just, and this is something I would say right now if you're not driving in the car, the words you choose don't describe reality. They actually create it. The words you use create reality around you. So the first big thing is be extra, I wouldn't say careful because that makes me feel like I might be a little fearful. Don't be careful, just be mindful. Be mindful of the words you choose to use really in every situation. Once you are, you can never not hear the words coming out of your mouth when you react mm-hmm. to things. <laughs> That's so true. Uh, so true, especially in the note spaces. We're talking with borrowers about their situation. Or uh, this time of year, it's a busy time with talking with bankers and asset managers to get them to send us lists that are on their, their, uh, their books they're looking to get rid of. So it's very key in the right words you use to have somebody send you the list versus somebody that just think you're a joker broker and uh, not take you seriously. So it's, I'm so glad you said that because that's such a valuable, valuable nugget out there for those that are listening out there today. Yeah. You know, the, in speaking, let's talk about the note world, the investor world. Like I said, I was just uh, teaching a, a class on negotiation for real estate investors. So people, you know, they're looking for real property, but you know, notes is similar, yep, so- but different. I'm not going to, I'm not the expert there. That's you. Um, but, you know, when, when it comes to some of the things we talked about in negotiation is, you know, it's just simple little things like um, knowing what your outcome is, like actually understanding what this is. So say you do pick up a distress note. Now you're connected to the borrower and, you're, and you have that first initial conversation. What is your outcome? If you just go in and say, I'm just going to feel this thing out and see how it goes. And I can't tell you how many people do that, not just in, in business, but in life. Mm -hmm. You know, they show up to a seminar and and I say, how come you're here? Like, what are your outcomes? What's your purpose for being here? What are your goals? And they'll say something like, you know, I heard you on the radio, Cyan TV. um, I thought it sounded pretty cool. So I'll see what this is all about. And I think to myself, man, like, first off, thank you for coming. Like, that's amazing. But when you walk into an experience with the outcome, your words are, let's see what happens versus I came here to intentionally create the next 10 years of my life. Or I want to find out exactly how to double my revenue for 2020. Like, that's what I'm here for. You know, and same thing goes for that note. 
what do, what do I want? What's my outcome? Do I want to recover 100% of my, the investment? Do I want 100% of the note? Am I looking to have a long term? What, what am I really wanting? It doesn't mean you're going to get your outcome. But you know, as, as a wise man once said, it's you'll get much better result if you shoot for the moon and hit the stars than if you aim for a pile of dung and hit it. At least you hit something, but you got to know what you're looking for. You'll get closer well, to what you're looking for. You know. But that's so important because when you program, it, technically program your mind, you're more likely to hit it. It's like setting that goal of what you want to accomplish versus just a, uh, that, that laissez-faire kind of, eh, I'll get around, yeah, whatever. I'm kind of, I'm just here to check it out. I'm going in with the intention to double my income or make a double digit return or close on 20 deals in the next six months off this relationship or to, to work out with the homeowners to keep them in their house if we can rehab the borrower versus having to foreclose. So well, and I love even that's a really important thing. Are you going in with the outcome of, I, I wish to rehab the borrower if possible, or are you like going in fearful going, Oh, this is my first deal. And I hope I don't lose my money and let's see if they're going to take advantage of me. It's like you conscious. Here's the thing. Consciously, you're not going to think that, but subconsciously that's the thing you have to watch for and how, you know, people ask a lot, how do I know what my subconscious is planning? How do I know what my subconscious is thinking? You know what your subconscious mind is thinking because it'll come out through your words when you're not thinking about it. Hey, Scott, how you doing today? I'm doing awesome, man. How about you? Hey, I'm doing awesome. How about you? See, like I've never asked you how you're doing without you saying something like, awesome, dude, phenomenal day. Oh my gosh. Like, and what happens is when you're not thinking about it, when you're distracted, how do you normally react? What words do you choose to say? The words are everything. And pay attention, especially when you're extra busy and you get, and you have a reaction when you're extra busy and someone says, Hey, how you doing? You know, it, isn't it fascinating? I'll bet you meet people that say, I'll oh, get by. How you doing? Well, better than dead. How you doing? Huh? Well, you know, trying to make something happen in this crazy <laughs> political climate. It, 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 <laughs> dude, it blows my mind how many people live their life emotionally upset mm -hmm. and like angry or disappointed or scared because their sports team lost mm -hmm. or because their non-favorite political candidate made the office or their favorite one didn't make the office or whatever. And I'm even talking about what's happening right now. Cause the question, like no matter what you think, one person goes, this is the worst political candidate in the history of the world. And there's yeah. someone else on their side of the fence going, this is the best thing that's ever happened to us. And they were upset the last term. So it's not about getting the right candidate. In. It's not about getting the right client. in. it's not about getting the right result. It's really about how we approach the result. And if you approach a result with an attitude of curiosity, with a, with a mindfulness of, okay, how can I get the things that I want in my life in this situation? The, the recession's coming. Okay, great. Let's say it is. How can I make sure my business thrives in a recession? I'm not saying it's always possible, but just asking that question is going to transform the way you approach it. And if you transform the way you approach it, you're much more likely to find the result you're looking for than not. I don't know exactly how much. It's certainly not a science, but I think it's pretty obvious that you're more likely to find what you're looking for when you're looking for it. Yeah, that's, that's such a true, but you're so right about the Debbie Downers out there. They take everything that happens to them and it's like, oh my God, I can't get out of bed today because so-and-so is in office or everything's so emotionally draining to them when you're like, wait a second, that, that has no bearing what he or she or whatever they do in the office has really no bearing on what I'm doing today to accomplish my goals and to help me get to where I need to be, right? And the truth is, and this, and this is not a political rant, but the truth yep. is most, and I mean by far most, policies and decisions and things are going to have either zero to very, very small effect on the majority of people that are worried about it. And I realized you could take what I just said and chunk down into a, a detail or into a specific instance and say, well, this one matters. And I, I would agree with you. There's a lot of places that it matters. But the, the overwhelming truth is um, when there's been a president in that I was not a fan of, um, I'm not saying which one because that's not the point. But when there's a president that I'm not a fan of, afterwards, like years later, I might find, okay, there was this one thing that eventually financially affected me. But most things, like my electricity bill isn't really changing. I get to spend time with my eight-year-old son and my wife really about as much as I was, no matter who's in office. This stuff doesn't really change, um, but it's our language and our response that is what we can control. So I guess my whole point is, and control what you can control, which is your response to things, not the things themselves.
such such great counsel there. Not advice, counsel. Because sage counsel. Every, every huh? Sage counsel. Sage counsel, exactly. <laughs> Everybody has advice. Uh, but the counsel is, is so true there because it, it, it you know it does have a huge now you're 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 speaking in ass in 13 months. I think about uh, the movie um uh, Oh, what was the one that just came out with Kevin Costner and the astronaut? And I'm getting, uh, was it Numbers? Where the, it was the ladies, the African American ladies that were all the engineers that did everything behind NASA. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Inside Numbers. Hidden like Figures. That. Figures, that was it. Figures. Hidden, yes, thank hidden you. Figures. That was hidden phenomenal. Figures, yes. yes, phenomenal. But you think about it. No, we're going to get there. I don't care what we've got to do. We're going to get there. That's such a strong. Um, character to have like listen I'm going to get there yeah we're going to have our ups and downs we're going to have failures along the way but the idea is we're going to learn more from our failures to get ultimately that point and I think so many entrepreneurs they get into it they leave their job to get into what they're doing full-time and they are like they're just winging it they're going through entrepreneurship kind of well let's see how this works out I can always go back to working for somebody and they don't have the type of success that they want based on uh, the fact that they're not focused or they let other things affect their emotions versus being driven on things, huh? Well, and you just said something really interesting. See, I, I, I'm a pattern nerd. So like, if anything, that's what I would relate to. Uh, of all the things that I do in life, I think teacher is probably the, the closest moniker that, that I would relate to at least because I love teaching you know, for a living. Um, so in doing that, I always hear patterns. And one thing you said for that, that example entrepreneur is I can always go back to my job. There's one specific language pattern. I taught this, I teach this in negotiation um, and it, it's, it's, it'll change how you get out of bed in the morning. It'll change how you go to sleep at night. It'll change how productive you are. And it'll change what you genuinely see as possible. This one language pattern uh, transforms life. It's so much more than it sounds. And the pattern is possibility versus necessity words. So there's two kinds of language I can use. I can use possibility oriented language. And possibility is positive and has drawbacks depending on the circumstance. So possibility words are words like can, could, would, uh, try. Try is actually a great possibility word, but you know, we all hear Yoda's voice in our head. Do or do not, there is no try. And we heard that and you had a boss who said, there's no try, you know, but the reality is try is actually a powerful word. And when you learn how to use it, like we use an NLP, like I could say, hey, you know what, Scott, try in vain not to get up as early as you can with energy tomorrow morning. And you might on the surface think, well, hang on a second. That's a negative suggestion. And you said, try and don't get up and all this, but you can actually use some of those. Like you, you, you felt the reaction, try in vain as hard as you can to not wake up tomorrow with bright energy. And somehow your subconscious mind hears what I wanted to hear. So words like try, can, might, may, could, would, these are all words that are possibility words. And when I speak in possibility, it does two things. Number one, it opens up more options. Mm -hmm. So possibility language always opens up more options. If you came to me and said, Matt, we got to have lunch Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. or nothing. That's what a planner says. And that means there's only one option. But if I said, hey, that might work, you know, maybe, maybe we can consider what? Some other options. Mm -hmm. Hey, maybe one of the other days will work. So possibility language opens up more options, which is great when you're looking at negotiating. So what happens is when you negotiate, the other person generally has one outcome. They have one stance they want. And your job as the negotiator or as the other side is the more options you have, the more chance you have to win. Very simple. And I'm not talking about win-lose. Ideally, you find a win-win scenario where it's about how can I get th them their outcome? But if they only have one option, and I only have one option. The chance for both of us to win is very low. Mm -hmm. You follow me on that? Yep. But if I go possibility options, possibility mode, okay, let's try to find a way. What, what else might we do? Well, I know we've tried this, but if we could find another way, what else would we try? Did you hear all those possibility words? And that tells my brain to start generating options. Mm -hmm. And if you can generate options, now you have place to go. So that's the upside to possibility language. So if you ever feel stuck, I guess that's my, my advice or my, my counsel, as you said, if you ever feel stuck in negotiation or honestly anywhere in life, I have to go to this job. Okay, if I don't have to go to the job, what else could I do? Might I find another way? Okay, that's another way. I could be homeless, awesome. What else could I do? Well, I could, I could get a Twitch account and learn how to get really good on Xbox and maybe make money that way, okay. 
That's one option. What else could I do? And you start generating options. Eventually, you might find that the best option was the original one, or you might find a better option you hadn't thought of. The quick downside to possibility language is sometimes it can keep you stuck in no action. Mm. Problem with possibilities is that you've talked to these people. You want to get together for lunch? Oh, yeah, we totally could. Anytime. Let me know. Maybe next week or the week after. If I'm talking possibility, I'm never creating deadlines and I always stay out of action because think about it. There's too many options. So if you have more than one option, how do you know which pathway to actually start down? You don't. So the upside to possibility language is it generates options when you feel stuck. The downside to possibility language is you can get stuck in inaction. So my favorite, uh, my favorite solution, I like to start every outcome in possibility world. So I generate as many options as possible. Then once I figure out which option might be the best, then I start using necessity language, which is things like have to, need to, must, it's time, things like that. So now I could say, think about it. Um, you know, how many notes could I get? You know, we could do a lot of things. Might we find this one or that one? And then once you figure out which way you want to go, you go, okay, now it's time. We need to find a way and we need to move forward and generate some revenue today. Let's do this. You must, right? So start in possibility, end in necessity. I went off on a little rampage there, but I hope that was useful. Very extremely useful. It was a must with a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute must. Absolute must. But that's, that's such a key thing though. And that's, describing and talking about it and, and, and opening up your brain, as you said, the options and then having, as you say, a lot of people just never get off of the, uh, the idea of, well, options. No, let's go down a path and this is the way we've got to go and go from there, right? Yeah, you, you got to start in options ideally. I mean, that's the best case scenario because you can start stuck and then generate options. And that's what people do when they feel like they're backpedaling. Mm -hmm. If you ever feel like you're getting cornered, Usually the reason is just energetically, linguistically, the reason you feel cornered is someone came at you necessity-minded or necessity-languaged. Hey, we got to figure something out about this. Hey, we need to get this done by Wednesday. And it's like, that might be the, the most intelligent option because of the deadline or the potential loss of revenue or whatever, but it doesn't mean it's the only option. So when somebody, uh, you start in necessity, you feel stuck. And then you'll, you'll look like you're backpedaling, but you're really trying to generate options. Hey, hang on, hang on. Before, before I go down this terrible road, what if we did this? What if we did that? What if we had, could we come up with a third one? My wife is a huge uh, eliminator of options yeah. because she likes to be done and decided and know what's coming six years from now. <laughs> I am a Wait, huge- Doesn't every spouse or girlfriend or boyfriend want that <laughs> on the opposite side, right? Usually, I, I, you know, they say opposites attract and- I think it's important that opposites attract with personality type very often and mode of operating, but it doesn't have to be in value. So like my wife and I, like we love each other very much. We share the same values and, and our vision for what we want, but our method of approaching like scheduling, for instance, she'll want to lock things down as quickly as possible because that lowers her anxiety levels and makes her feel great. For me, if you lock me down too quickly, that raises my anxiety. Mm -hmm. It makes me feel terrible. So I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, I know this is what we landed on already, but is there another option? Could we, could we at least just look at them? If not, just look at them to eliminate them. Mm -hmm. But I, I would like to at least look at them before, uh, before I decide one thing. So it's also helpful to know kind of what's your preset when it comes to that language pattern. And the way you, here's one quick trick to know what your preset is, what your default is. And I'll ask you if I can, can I ask you? You can ask me anything. This will be fun. So Scott, what's the very first thing you say to yourself when, when you wake up in the morning? Or what's the last thing you say to yourself before you get out of bed? Even better. Let's get rocking. Let's get rocking. Let's get rocking. What do you say next? I usually like get up, scratch my head, and just kind of roll into, okay, what's, what's in store for me today, basically? It's kind of what I mentally say to myself. Okay, let's get rocking. Can't lay here anymore. Let's get, let's get rocking and rolling. And what's, what's on the tap? You know, there we go. I love that. So you said a lot of words. And the reason I kept asking is what you're looking for is a, is a possibility or necessity word. So some people will wake up in the morning and they'll say, you know, right when they, not when you wake up, but right like before you get out of bed, they'll say, oh, I got to get up. I got to get up is a necessity word. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it means that you feel like there's only one option. And especially if there's like a negative emotion, now it feels like you're stuck. Now, mm. some people say, hey, it's time to get up and they're happy about it. That's a necessity, but it's positive. So it's a necessity, meaning it's action time, and that's good. So you said, got a rock, and then you said, 
can't sit around any longer or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. So the only word you used actually was really interesting was can't. Now here's what's neat. You know what that means? You're not screwed up. You're actually really, really intelligent, very smart man. It means that you operate sometimes out of a modal operator, of, um, not impossibility, which sounds weird, but it's very cool. So if, like if something bad happened in your life, you would probably say something like, you know what? I'm not, I can't let this get me down. Let's move forward. Mm -hmm. So you would hit the impossibility and say, I'm not, this ain't going to happen, right? This can't be the way. So yeah, I yeah. think when, when impossible odds come your way, um, you very easily see them as possible. You say, that's not going to happen that way. And then you go into necessity and say, let's get rocking. Let's do this. Let's go up. So you go from impossibility to necessity, which is actually pretty darn cool. I think it's probably one of the genius patterns, I would think. You know, somebody would call me a genius. I think I would call me an idiot, but that's okay. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I should do a quiz for this. I don't have one, but I'll make one. <laughs> that's a good idea. Yeah, but that's the thing. I, yeah, and you hit it to the nail right in the head there. Um, when things happen, when deals go south or, you know, bad things happen, I'm like, okay, let's look at this. Okay, let's move in. Let's get, let's get moving. Let's, move, let's not sit here paralyzed, but by what's happened, let's find a way to get around it and, you know, I, I'm a big believer that the, the worst possible things only exist in our minds. And then what real reality happens is somewhere in between the best and the pot worst, somewhere in that middle there for the most part. So when, when things can seem like they're the, the craziest or the worst, I'm like, okay, this is not reality. Let me get rock and roll uh, and go from there. Yeah. Re reality is never what we perceive it to be. And I know that sounds very like metaphysical or something. It's not. Um, it's based on, there's a really great book that if any of you guys like books, um, the book is flow written by a Hungarian biologist named Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. I don't know if you've ever, you, you might want to say that name again. That's pretty impressive that you just rolled off your tongue like that. Hey, look, I, I'm not going to spell it, but I will say it again. It's the book is flow by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, um, Hungarian biologist. And he studied, uh, perception of reality. Very, very fascinating study. And what he found was, um, when people walk around in any given moment, just assuming we have all five of our senses available to us, that the world is giving us at any given second, 2.3 million bits of information. Mm -hmm. So a bit is like just the smallest bit of information. Yep. And that's everything you're taking in, everything you see. And if you're in Times Square, New York City, it's probably more. And if you're sitting on a farm in Iowa, it's probably less. But somewhere in that range, there's millions of bits of information every second coming into our awareness through what we see, what we hear, what we feel, and then what we smell and taste. But he estimates that the conscious mind can only process 126 out of those 2.3 million bits. That's less than one one thousandth of 1%. And what it means is when you and I call, we say this is reality. And I say, this is what happened to me today. The reality we're actually talking about is only the 126 bits. The 2.3 million are still out there. So that's how you can have, you and I can have two very different experiences uh, even of this podcast, you know, I could say, oh my gosh, I had so much fun. It was amazing. From my perspective, it was a blast. And then Scott goes, are you kidding me? This guy was dry and he was boring and he was the he had terrible beard and I couldn't believe it. And it was just the worst time ever. And it's like, how do we have two different experiences of the exact same reality? Well, that's because your 126 and my 126 are not going to be the same 126. Mm -hmm. This is the basis for how we construct uh, not to go too deep, but it's called a subjective reality. Reality subject to the observer. Subjective reality is like you and I saying, do we, what do we agree on? Objective reality means, hey, there's a podcast happening. This is a radio show. Subjective reality is, well, how good was it? Was it good or bad? Was it long or short? Well, it depends. If you listen to Joe Rogan, it's probably going to be short. But if you listen to five-minute daily med uh, you know, meditations, it's super long. That's all subject to the person interacting with it. And what NLP really studies and what, what I do with, with our certification courses and clients and, and trainings is teach us how to interact more effectively, more powerfully, and honestly, more intentionally so we can find the 126 bits or the reality that we're looking for. And if we see the ones we don't like, how do you change those things? Good. I love it. But it's, it's what comes to mind when you're talking about that is like, I'll give you an example. It's funny thing. It's like going to Disneyland. For, there's 2 million things going on and people only see the 126, like you said. And it's a very different experience for most people, especially if everybody's all excited about the rides and the candy and all the, the, the characters. And then 
the dads are running through and they're tired of being the pack horse and getting their knees and shins <laughs> roll into there. And they're like, Oh, it's a hundred degrees outside. I'm tired. I need a drink to deal with all the screaming kids and the kids are running around like crazy. But that's a great, great, great description of it. 2.6 2. or 2.3 million. 3 million bits. That's the estimate wow. at least. You get, Down you to 126. It. And so the real question, yeah. And the biggest question to ask, and sorry to cut you off, but the biggest question right. to ask is, how does our, because our, your subconscious mind is the one that differentiates between the 2.3 and 126. It filters them as it were. So the biggest question is, how the heck does your mind decide which bits are relevant and will make it through and which bits won't? So, you know, the, the get everyone going through Disneyland. I mean, it, it would be a very different day for the teenager who's excited to get on the ride and get dizzy a hundred times in a row and someone who's older maybe has a phobia of roller coasters. These are two very different experiences of the exact same park, the exact same ride. So the question is, how do we differentiate and determine which parts to focus on, which parts not to? Well, mm -hmm. it's something we teach in NLP called our filters. You filter information because of your attitude, because of the language you use, as we talked about. Uh, we filter things through our values, like values are what's important to you. So if having a great time uh, with your family and exploring new things and being outside and amongst people, if, th if those are important values, hey, you're gonna have a blast. But if it's important to you to be in total control, to be able to not be touched when you don't want to be touched, <laughs> and when you're going around strangers and staying in line, you're probably gonna get touched at some point. Someone's gonna walk by you. Um, if you're highly introverted versus highly extroverted, the high extrovert, by the end of the day at Disney, it'll be 10 p.m. and they're like, come on, mom, we can get three more rides in. It's finally calming down. But if you're highly introverted, you might love people, but being around them is going to slowly deplete your battery. So by 4 p.m., you were done. You're a soup sandwich. So what experience will you have? It depends on your personality traits, your attitude, your language, your mindset, your values. And these are all things that are, it's really cool. They're actually discoverable and then changeable in the world of NLP. We can sit mm. down and, and discover your values and your wife's values uh, and figure out, hey, well, how could you, you have a high value of this and she has a high value of that. And what's cool is you might find that's where potential conflict shows up. And then how you resolve conflict is by sometimes shifting those values, becoming aware of them. So you can, even if they don't change, you know, like my wife values alone time. I value parties and being around people. It's just something like how we're wired. So it's not that we change each other through NLP. We don't do some, I don't do some voodoo pattern on her or something. and She doesn't do it on me, but we've learned to validate and respect each other's experiences because it's not just, oh, how come you're a party pooper? And she's like, gosh, you don't respect me and you always stay late when you say you're going to leave. Well, that's not actually the truth. The reality is closer to, you know, like we can respect each other and go, oh, you need to recharge a little bit. So I want to honor that. And I want to maybe bring you home and call the night short. And she'll say, oh, you charge up when you're around people. So, you know, let's make sure that we plan some time when people come over. Maybe not every night, but we'll plan it. So it's just kind of, again, about validating and understanding filters people have and then how to step into them a little more intentionally. Sometimes it's with personality, sometimes with language and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, that's, that's some of the fun that I get to get into in these deep dive seminars. I love <laughs> it's, it. Now, it's this kind of conversation. It is. Now, how did you... What made you want to go from being on the, the real estate side, diving into this? What was the, what's the big thing, Matt, that was that kind of that um, moment or aha, moment that you, this is the way you want to go? Because that's just, this just gets me just jacked up, excited about listening. To, we talk about this all day long. I love listening to this, but what was the biggest pinnacle to get you to move and decide you wanted to go this route? You know, I, I saw Tony Robbins a while back. I was 22 and I saw him, all our real estate guys, uh, my boss bought tickets for us. And when, I saw, when I saw Tony, I thought, man, that's really cool. I think like he's helping people get their patterns and find out. And, and it turns out a lot of people don't know this because Tony doesn't call it NLP anymore, but he started off as an NLP trainer and mm -hmm. the technology behind what he does with arenas of 16,000 people is NLP. And so I got really fascinated by that and I decided to study as quick as I could. And I put on my first seminar, big success. There were six people there, including my parents. <laughs> and uh, you know, at the end of it, I thought, oh, I don't know if I really made an impact. Because again, I was going to my real estate office and I just felt like I was just doing transactions, so to speak. Yeah. But the part that really got me jacked up was when, you know, it was, it's weird to say this, but sometimes it, it was a husband and wife would come in and you could tell they were conflicted over what decision to make on a refi or a purchase of a house. And instead of talking numbers and facts, 
I started just asking them questions about what do they value and the kind of stuff we're talking about. And I found that instead of just being congruent at the end of making a decision on a home, it was like, I really, I felt like I helped them to understand each other more. Um, and, and like, I just got fascinated by that. So I put on my first seminar and at the end of it, I was like, well, this is it. I thought people were going to cry and it was going to be amazing. And everyone just said, thanks, Matt. And they left. But one girl stayed behind. Her name was Kay. And I, I hope at some point she's listening. She lives in Japan now. At the time, she was an exchange student living here. And she became a good friend of mine. Um, she came up to me at the end of the seminar. And I talked about this decision-making process, about changing your beliefs and changing your limiting beliefs and what you believe is true. And she had changed a limiting belief about herself in that process with NLP. And it was a really, really big decision for her. And she came up to me and it was just this, this beautiful moment because she just looked at me and said, and I was like, hey, Kay. And she goes, Matt. And she had this kind of beautiful broken English accent. I'm not going to do it justice, but she said, Matt. And she said, I make a new decision today. And my life will never be the same again. And she was very serious. And I was kind of taken back. I went, oh my gosh, like you mean it. And I said, Kay, that, that's awesome. And she reaches out and she gives me this big hug. I hug her back and she has a tear in her eye. And I'm like, mm. and then she starts crying and now I'm crying. And, and I'm just like, I'm, I'm in my first seminar ever just holding this beautiful soul and just, just crying because there was a moment in her life that was pivotal and she changed. And I knew that, that she wasn't going to go back to devaluing herself, mm. going back to a negative relationship. She wasn't going to go back to an old pattern. She had made a choice and a line in the sand and changed. And I didn't do it for her, but I helped as a catalyst. And that, in that moment, as I'm holding her, I just thought, this is it. Thank you, God. This is what I'm going to do the rest of my life. Um, I don't care if I go broke or get rich or I don't, I don't care where, what this does. I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. And it, it took a couple of years of really scratching and clawing, quite frankly, because I didn't know anything about seminar business or a coaching business. I knew about the real estate and mortgage business. Um, and I thought it was all different. So I'm trying to find coaching clients. And I have no idea what to do. And within a couple of years, I finally realized business principles are business principles. So I started applying the same thing with marketing and prestige. And I started getting out and speaking and, you know, and so forth and so on. That was the rest of the story. But that was the moment that transformed everything. So, but I'm, I will, I'll always invest in, in real estate, but I'll never not do what I do today for a living because, okay. Such a great, such a great story. But that's, it's a, a big thing of being able to apply it fine where I, I say, because sometimes I feel like I'm a wedding counselor sometimes with our students when I'm talking with a you know, husband and spouse, they're both coming from different areas. They're seeing different things. And you said something there. You felt like you were kind of bringing them together doing mortgages. It's kind of that same way a lot of times. Okay, what's your value? What are your fears? And let's help you overcome those fears and realize that, hey, this is the product for you, or this is the deal that will solve that issue, or hey, this is not the deal. You need to listen to what your spouse says though, that, so that they're more supportive when you get into wanting to do what you want to do, right? Yeah, you know, any business, really, if you can understand like the NLP processes, language patterns, and just general coaching frames for life, any business is going to, if you have a tire business, it's like, trust me, at the end of the day, it's never about the tire. And mm -hmm. it's not about the note, and it's not about the mortgage, and it's not about the house. You know, whatever you sell, it's never about the widget. It's always about the person and what they're really looking for, what they want, what are their goals, what are their hopes, what are their fears. And, and even, again, someone buying tires. It's not about, well, if I can give you 20 bucks cheaper on the tire, then you'll be happy. It's like, no, they want someone, what do they really want to know? I want to know that you took care of me. I want to know that you understand what I'm really looking for. And if you understand, so I'll ask, you know, if I own a tire shop, I don't, but if I did, it's not about, oh, so you want this brand of tire that, no, what are you looking for? Are you, do you want to, to get the very best your money can buy and have top, top shelf? Like, no, you have the best integrity. Do you want the best deal because life is hard and money's tight and you want to get a good bang for your buck and that's all you're really looking for? Do you want to look good out there? Like, what are you really wanting? Do you want to just be one and done? And sometimes people want that. Or do you want a relationship where I'll make sure that you're taken care of? You can come back in here and we'll do free tire rotations because we want to, you to know that you're taken care of, that we actually care. And if you start to speak, I guess this is the lesson, put it on a bumper sticker, speak to the client's values, not their needs. And if you speak mm -hmm. to the client's values, that's where people understand that you are their person. 
and this is your, your homeowner you're trying to negotiate a note for, this is the bank who has a whole list of them, speak to their values. And you can find out someone's value. Here, I always love trying to give the application, the actual how-to for every uh, principle. So the how-to for how you discover someone's value is very simple. You ask this one question, what's important to you about blank? And it seems super obvious when I say it, but no one asks that. You know, if you're selling a printer at Staples, no printer salesman in the history of printer salesmen, usually, unless he took my class, has said, hey, what's important to you about a printer? They'll say, oh, what do you, what do you need? What features? What, what? No, what's important to you about it? And you'll find, because someone will say right off the bat, quality. They don't want a hunk of junk. Or they might say affordability. Mm -hmm. Or they might say, I want the best. You know, you ask a, someone waiting in line at Apple, what's important to you about a, a tech? And they go, I want the newest thing. I want to be able to do everything. I want the best camera. Someone else might say, well, I want this. I want that. So what's important to you about blank? And if, and if they give you an answer, it should be a one, two word answer, like, you know, freedom, quality, success, uh, care, joy, fun, uh, high revenue, whatever, you know, whatever the product service is. But if they give you one answer, then ask again, great. And what else is important to you? What else is important to you? And eventually you'll get at least their top three answers. And look, there might be other values in there, but you have a pretty good guess of what their top three values are and the order that they're in. Again, it could be shifted a little bit, but I mean, 80-20 rule, 80% of the time, if you just went with the first three answers they gave you, that would probably be the first three values they have in the right order. So Scott, why is that important? Because you can speak to values. Mm -hmm. You can sell to values. When you feed back, and again, let's talk about the distressed uh, note um, mortgagee or, or um, promissory borrower. note yep. borrower, right? So when you're talking to that borrower and you say, hey, what's important about this house or this home or this note or this mortgage or whatever? And if you get their top three values, when you give your solution, when you say, here's what we're gonna do, we're gonna cut this to zero interest, or what if we cut the amount, or what if we, whatever you decide to do, whatever your solution is, feed it back to them speaking their values out loud. So you say, this is my idea. What if, remember I talked earlier about possibility mode, Scott? Mm -hmm. So if you're going to give them an idea, this is actually a negotiation point. If you're going to present a, a solution, start, always start, even if you only have one idea, always start with possibility language. So I'll say something like this. You know, I've been thinking about your situation uh, quite a bit, and I've been going through a few ideas. See, options. I've been going through a few ideas. Here's a couple of things we came, I came up with that we could do. So for instance, what if, and a what if is a possibility mode all the way, right? Hey, what if? We did A, B, C, and this is what we did. And I believe that would, be, that would be a great solution because if we did it this way, we could really provide, you know, we could get you back into, you know, out from under this thing so you would feel free and you'd feel like you have a little more control over your situation and honestly bring some joy back to your life if those were the three words they gave you. Does that make sense? So like give them a solution and then say this solution would give you these three values essentially. Don't just list them, but put them into a sentence. If you can do that, you'll watch people light up like a Christmas tree, man. It'll like, they are, you're speaking their language. Speaking their language and, and, and bouncing back that you're actually listening to what they're saying versus going into a pre-programmed pitch. You're actually listening, taking it in and then actually coming back to them with an actual true solution whether it's one or multiple ways based on, their, as you said, selling or listening to their values and, 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 and really identifying those and come up with a solution that hits that. Yeah. Scripts are good for about the first to third sentences of a conversation. That's my opinion. <laughs> I think they're very important for the first, like you need to know exactly what you're going to say word for word when they pick up the phone. Yep. Beyond that, after the first few sentences, it has to turn into a conversation. It has to turn to listening. And if you can ask questions and you can get them to answer something, then you can dive into values and find out what's actually important in their situation. And man, I mean, sometimes it's so powerful, Scott, like you ask someone what's important to you about this. I've had people say, stop in there. When I was doing mortgages, they'd stop in their tracks and say, no one's ever asked me that. Mm. No one's ever, no mortgage guy has ever asked me that in the history. And I've been doing, I've owned property for 50 years, Matt. And I've never had someone ask me that. They always just try to sell me the rate or whatever. And and, and look, like if you want to be the, the person who gets shopped around, you know, if you're doing a mortgage, like I, I never had people shop me for an eighth of a rate difference or whatever. 
they, once they understood that I got them and I cared and they knew I'd take care of them and they knew that I actually understood their value, what's important. Hey, I need to be hands off. I want this to be as, as clean and fast as possible. Awesome. We got you. It wasn't about what rate I gave them. It's about that I can give them what they actually want. Mm -hmm. Is rate important? Yeah, but it's never about the rate. <laughs> Amen to that, brother. Yeah. Now, how often are you teaching workshops across the country where people can learn more? Because this is all valuable stuff. So I want to make sure if you've got a class coming up or you've got a schedule where people can connect with you to find out when and where you're going to be so they can take the opportunity to, to get signed up and learn more. I'm geeking out. I'm just loving this, okay? so That's so fun. Well, th thanks, Scott. You know, honestly, I, like they're, they're all different times. Uh, especially for 2020 and beyond if this goes, you know, evergreen. So if you're listening to this right now, um, the best way is just, you know, check out the podcast. If you like the note closer show, you probably love other radio shows and podcasts. We're actually on some of the same networks at different yeah. times. Uh, uh, my show goes coast to coast as well as Scott's does. So check out the driven entrepreneur. I do two episodes a week. Tuesday is a teaching Tuesday. Like I just wrapped up a four part mini series on the power of purpose and how to find purpose and vision and bring it back into your life and your business. Very, very good stuff, if I don't say so myself. Um, yeah. But it, it was like very timely, relevant conversation that people are asking me. So I always do Teaching Tuesdays and then Interview Fridays. I have phenomenal entrepreneurs and visionaries and we get into their backstory, their origin story of how they became who they are. We had the illustrious Scott Carson on. We've had uh, Hort Schulze, the, founder of Ritz, the founding president of Ritz-Carlton. Um, Kathy O'Dowd, the first woman to climb Everest from both sides. We've had people from all different backgrounds of life, um, athletics, business, whatever. So that's Friday. So the Driven Entrepreneur. And then you just follow me on social media, at Matt Browning. It's B-R-A-U-N-I-N-G, German spelling, at Matt Browning on every platform, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, wherever you go, find me there. And I'd love to connect. I actually answer messages and, uh, and we have a ton of fun there. And that's where I'll put up some videos and content and new things. Uh, especially about classes coming up or NLP content. That's awesome, Matt. Matt, you've just absolutely blown away. I guarantee people are loving this out there. I know I am. So if I'm getting excited, I'm pretty sure my audience is getting pretty jacked up there. So I want to say thank you for taking time on your busy, hectic schedule to be here on the Note Close Show. Thank you for showing up and delivering such amazing content and, uh, and just being an awesome guy that you are, Matt. Dude, thanks, Scott. It was a pleasure. Uh, always happy to. Always great to see you, my friend. You brother. Thanks, man. All right, guys, that's going to wrap it up for this episode of the Note Closure Show. Like Matt said, go check him out. You can follow him at Matt Browning, the German spelling, B-R-A-U-N-I-N-G. Check it out. The links will be in the show as well. If you're watching this YouTube, we'll put a link into his, also his stuff in the description on uh, the video. But check it out. Like it. Follow him. And he does respond. If you got questions, reach out to him. He'll be glad to reach out to you and uh, answer best he can. But go out, guys. Take some action. Take, take what the counsel that Matt provided and learn to program your brain, program what you're saying to really be able to identify the values of the people that you're talking to, be able to figure out what the, is important to them and come back and be more effective in how you're a, either a working with borrowers, working with banks or working with investors as well too out there for you. So go out, take some action, everybody, and we'll see you all at the top.